My name is Russell Wolf, and I'm going to talk to you about building a multi-platform Kotlin library. Um, so a few quick notes about myself. Um, I'm an Android developer at a company called Intrepid up in Boston. Um, we're part of Accenture, and we do um, all sorts of digital product design, which in practice means we build mobile and web apps. Um, also, one of the organizers behind Kotlin Office Hours, which is a uh, monthly meetup in the Boston area. So come check us out if you're ever up there. Um, and I'm a uh, quick little agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk through what um, code sharing looks like in Kotlin, specifically for mobile apps, and uh, kind of what the architecture of that looks like. And then I'm going to walk you through a example of a library I've been building called Multiplatform Settings um, that uses all this stuff. So. Um, Starting off with code sharing, um, just a quick show of hands, who has done anything with multi-platform Kotlin, even if it's just kind of building demos, building examples? Okay, a couple of you. Um, and how about um, with uh, Kotlin Native? Yeah, a couple more. Cool, cool. Um, so give some review to you, those guys and some new stuff to the rest of you. Um, this is what it looks like when we build apps today. Um, I and my, the, my team with me built an Android app. The people next to us built an iOS app. We do a lot of talking to each other. We, we try to coordinate and make sure we're, we're building this in the same way, but there's a lot of duplication that happens. Um, and it's not always easy to keep things in, in sync to make sure that we're sharing concepts and not kind of relearning the same lessons twice. Um, it'd be much nicer to live in a world where we could have some sort of shared dependency where the bits of business logic and application architecture that make sense to share could be written just once while still having a native UI layer um, around all of it. And Kotlin turns out to be a pretty nice tool to do that. Um, so we'll talk through uh, kind of some of those, um, some of the reasons that's the case. Um, so Kotlin Native is a way to compile your Kotlin source code um, without a virtual machine, um, so without the JVM. Um, via the LLVM compiler. Um, and it lets you target a number of native platforms, including iOS, um, and interoperate with the native APIs for those platforms um, in the same way that your, the JVM problem that you used to can interoperate with Java APIs. And there's Gradle plugins. I'm not going to go into too much detail on them, but there's, there's uh, actually two Gradle plugins because they're kind of changing it and putting in a new one um, to do that configuration for you in a way that feels fairly familiar to what you're used to um, in a JVM Gradle project. In a, sorry, JVM Gradle project. Um, and the big thing that we get from um, Kotlin Native is Objective C and Swift interop, um, which in actuality is Objective C interop, and Objective C knows how to talk to Swift. Um, so there's a couple little things that can get lost in translation, such as generics, but um, overall, you can like it's it's pretty powerful. Um, you can write Kotlin code, looks a little bit like this. You might have a function, you might have a class um, defined in your Kotlin code, and Swift can see it. Um, it'll generally have kind of some sort of um, prefix to the call based on whatever the um, framework name that you created. Um, but you can call into your Kotlin code from your Swift. Um, so just Kotlin native um, lets you run Kotlin on iOS, um, but that doesn't get you code sharing yet. Um, what gets you that is multi-platform, um, which is a framework that JetBrains has been working on that um, essentially gives you this common code layer um, so that you can compile, uh, compile source code with a sort of subset of the standard library um, that can then be run on all the different platforms that Kotlin can run on. Um, and the focus on it is to share not everything, but kind of your logic layer, the, the things that, um, that aren't platform dependent, um, so that like, the pieces that are unique to our app can be shared, but the, the things that make sense to be native can stay native. Um, and there's also a mechanism for defining platform-specific implementation code so that when you need to call into platform-specific APIs from your common code, you're able to do so. And what that looks like is expect in actual declarations. Um, so these basically let you define something in your common code, um, sorry, declare something in your common code with the implementation defined um, in your platform code. Um, and the compiler essentially forces you to have a 
one-to-one uh, -one correspondence so that each platform has a single implementation for each uh, expect operation. Um, a little bit like having a uh, dependency injection framework um, where the, the um, Kotlin compiler will force you to, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of make sure that that implementation is there and put it in place for you. And what that looks like is I might have in my common code um, this function defined with an expect declaration. Um, and I use the actual keyword on Android and iOS, um, and I can give it two different implementations um, based on whatever I need for that platform. So with all of that there, um, this kind of simple picture that we started from ends up looking a little bit more complicated, um, but we can talk through this and kind of digest it. Um, so the orange box in the center there is our common module, is kind of the, um, the shared code that's kind of our goal. Um, we want to kind of put as much as we can in there so that we don't have to write it twice. Um, to the left and right of that um, are where our actual declarations go. Um, so on Android, that ends up producing um, the same sort of uh, AR library uh, artifact that you would get, that you're used to um, in general from building an Android library. And on iOS, you can expose your Kotlin native code as a framework, which is the um, iOS and Xcode um, dependency, or, uh, dependency format, um, which you can then um, uh, expose to your Xcode project and your iOS app. Um, so uh, what's, what, what's cool here is, is most of this is um, built with Gradle modules in the way that you're used to. Um, and then just in the upper right there, um, the iOS box is where you have this kind of um, boundary where you move, to, you move back to the native iOS tools to build your native iOS UI. Um, but what about um, when we want to have dependencies that we can call from that common layer? Um, so by default, um, you have the Kotlin standard library. Um, so you, you can kind of write simple little bits of logic there. But uh, you, you, you kind of, um, like, we, we need to sort of write, write more libraries so that there are other things that we can do. And so that's, that's kind of what I want to focus on. And what that looks like um, is essentially a library ends up looking like another kind of layer underneath the um, application shared code layer with the same three parts. Um, so in the center, you have another, a common module for your library. Um, to the left and the right, you have the, um, the platform implementations of, the, of, of that common code. Um, and uh, again, on Android, it looks pretty much the same as you're used to. Um, on iOS, you now get a new piece. Um, instead of building a framework, you're now building a Klib, which is the Kotlin native library format and the reason for that is that um, this blue box in the bottom right is not actually ever going to is not not being exposed to Xcode into your native iOS code. It's just it's being exposed to the Kotlin at the level above it, and so it no longer uh, it no longer cares about being a native iOS dependency type. Um, it just wants to be Kotlin. Um, so we're going to focus on this library layer, and I'm going to talk through this library that I've been building called Multi-Platform Settings. Um, it's not a super original name. I might try to come up with something more clever at some point, but I haven't yet. Um, so it's on GitHub. You can check it out there. And what it does is let you save simple key value data um, from your common code um, and persist that between app starts. Um, under the hood, it's wrapping shared preferences, which you're probably familiar with from Android, and a similar API called User Defaults on iOS. And uh, you may know that the Droidcon app this year is written using multi-platform Kotlin, um, so they're actually using this library. Um, so you can actually see that it works, which is pretty cool. Um, thanks to Kevin over there for that. So I'll talk through a little bit of code um, and kind of show you how, how this thing is built. Um, so the core of it, um, there's an interface called settings, defines a bunch of get methods, put methods, um, exactly what you sort of expect if you're used to the Shared Preferences API. Um, it has an implementation called Platform Settings, um, which is implemented using a bunch of expect actual declarations. Um, and the reason for that is I wanted both to be able to expose different platform implementations, but also have an interface that 
um, users of the library could mock out in their own unit tests, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, the platform settings class um, does not expose, or does not define its own constructor, um, because we need to be able to pass that in from the platform layer. So we need to create a uh, shared preferences object on Android or a uh, NS user defaults object on iOS, which can then, uh, yeah, which can then be passed to the settings object. Um, and, and, and the only reason for that is, is because um, in, in my particular case, like I needed to have this platform specific dependency. Um, if you're building your own thing, you may be able to get by with just instantiating it from your common code. Um, to make this a little bit easier, I also added this factory class um, so that the, like, the reason that this is hard is that Android needs a context. Um, so um, I built this factory API basically so I could pass in that context once and then create multiple settings objects if you want to um, just from your uh, common code. So now the, the actual creation um, is happening in the, or is happening with, with the same API for each platform um, so you can run it from your common code. Um, so once you have that created, um, I have some get methods. Um, and the lesson to take here is your implementations can be very thin. Um, like my, my get API uh, essentially looks exactly the same as shared preferences, passing a key, passing a default value. Um, you don't have, like th 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 this early um, in this ecosystem, you don't have to necessarily do a lot. Um, the value that you're creating by building a library here is by doing the Android and iOS binding and not necessarily by adding a whole lot new um, in terms of functionality. Um, but one thing that you do have to pay some attention to is where these APIs differ. So iOS does not, the, the user defaults API on iOS does not have a concept of default value um, the way that Android does, and I still wanted to expose that in my library API. Um, so I have to do a little bit of extra work to check if things exist and return the default value if so on iOS. Um, so in addition to sets, you obviously want, or in addition to gets, you obviously want some sets, uh, some put methods. Um, here I kind of hide some of the Android complexity. Um, so I wasn't interested in the editor extraction that your preferences have in, has um, in my common code. Um, so I just kind of call that internally in my put methods. Um, I also do a little bit of uh, kind of sneaky under the hood work um, to account for the fact that the um, the types that Android and iOS expose are actually slightly different. So shared preferences doesn't actually let you save doubles, and iOS does. Um, so I thought I'd build a, a double uh, API anyway on Android, um, which is just kind of calling into longs under the hood and converting that um, via bytes. Um, so once your um, once you have those kind of um, platform APIs in place, um, you can start to do some other more powerful things from your common code that you just have to code once. So I have some delegates, um, so some functions that return rewrite property objects so you can use that nice spy syntax. Um, also some operator functions so that you can get that nice bracket syntax when you're getting and setting things. And the lesson here is once you've kind of abstracted your, your platform APIs away, there's a lot of power that you can get from just building things once um, at the common Kotlin layer. So some general lessons. Um, it's okay to, to be thin. It's okay to not, um, not add a lot of new functionality. Um, the value here, again, is in having something that you can call from both platforms. Um, but also, you do sometimes have to do some work um, to make sure that the API that you're exposing is the same. Um, and sometimes that's actually pretty hard. Um, so I've, I've mostly just kind of exposed the, the simple, easy APIs thus far. Um, I'd like to add some more. I'd like to add some listeners. I'd like to add some, like, see the whole set of all of your keys and stuff like that, other APIs like that. Um, they're a little funkier because they actually look a little bit more different on the different platforms, and there's more kind of decisions that you have to make in terms of what you want the shared API to look like. So in addition to the library itself, um, in that repository, I also have a sample app. Um, generally a good idea when you're building a library anyway. I think it's especially important um, in this Kotlin multi-platform world because there's not a whole lot of code samples at the moment. Um, and so I think it's really valuable if you want to build something like this to make sure you demonstrate its usage, demonstrate how things are configured um, so people have more examples to learn from. 
So what my sample does is basically just a simple list of um, one setting of each type um, and a UI to get and set them. Um, so the idea is to show how to use the library from the common code and build a normal UI um, at the platform level. So this is what it looks like when you run it. Um, just a simple bare bones API at the top. You can select the different keys that you want to use. Um, you can input a value, some buttons to do different operations, and a little output field. Um, I'm not going to show you the actual platform code here because it's not any different than what you normally write to build this UI, um, which is the point. Underneath it, though, um, there's a common code layer. And uh, for that, I defined this settings repository class, um, which just ho holds a list of these settings to big objects that define what the different UI operations like what, what each of those button clicks essentially means um, for each key. Um, the API ended up being a little more convoluted than I like. I might do some refactors there. But the point is you can build an app, show that everything works, and you can um, give people an example of how to use your code. Um, and then in the UI code, um, each of the apps just instantiates one of those objects and builds its UI and calls into the methods that it needs from there. So um, in addition to sample app, obviously we want to make sure everything is tested and that it works. Um, unit testing is of course always important, but again, a lot of this stuff is especially important when we're in this new ecosystem and we want to make sure that we can demonstrate that everything works as we expect on both platforms. Um, so to help us with that, um, there, um, Kotlin has these Kotlin test annotations um, that you can use from your common code that look a lot like what you might be used to with uh, JUnit. Um, and yeah, you, you can write your tests in the common layer and run them on both platforms. So to design these tests in my instance, I had to do a little bit of thinking about how to um, use the shared preferences and user defaults APIs. Um, so I, I, I did a couple iterations of that where initially I was building some custom mocks and I didn't really like how that felt because it was kind of testing the mock code more than it was testing the actual code. Um, so I ended up opting for using RoboElectric on Android um, and using similar tests on iOS, um, which lets you kind of run something, run on something pretty close to the architecture that um, would actually be used in the app. Um, and I also um, ended up um, writing some tests at the sample level in addition to the library level. Um, not really looking for full coverage there, but looking for demonstrating that it is possible to test application code that is using this settings library um, and be able to mock it out and things like that. So, um, some uh, sample code there. Um, the test at the library level um, has this, um, this before test is like your J, uh, J unit before annotation. The test annotation obviously is the same as the J unit test annotation. Um, so the unit test looks pre pretty similar to what you might be used to in the Android world. Um, and similarly, we have asserts that should look pretty similar to what you're used to. Um, and we still have the ability to do all of the multi-platform things that, that we were doing before. So we still need to um, create a, a settings object or a settings factory in a platform specific way, and we can still use expecting actual declarations to do that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, test and sample layer too. Um, here, this is why I wanted to make sure I had a settings interface in addition to the platform settings implementation so that at the application level, it's possible to just mock it out entirely. Um, so I did this manually because there's not really a good um, multi-platform Android and iOS mocking framework that exists right now. Um, but my API was simple enough that you can just kind of build it by hand. So I have this mock settings object. Um, I define this stub so that I can use that as the implementation for every method. And then at the use site in my tests, I can just um, make an honest class, so I'll subclass it, override the functionality that I need for my test with the behavior that the test needs, and then test the actual application code. Um, so that's testing. Once you have that, um, you want to start putting it out there. Um, so you're used to, perhaps, if, if you're a library developer, um, publishing um, jar files and AR files, um, which is what the um, common and the Android um, modules uh, create. Um, you can do the same thing with a Calib. Um, so you can you can create Maven dependencies um, using all of this stuff. 
um, and actually in my sample app um, opted to actually um, read the dependencies from Maven um, in order to demonstrate that yes, this actually does work. So now we've seen kind of a whirlwind tour of what some of this stuff looks like. Um, what are some of the difficulties that can come up if you want to build your own? Um, so obviously this stuff is also very early. Um, so multi-platform is um, like it's it's getting mature. Like um, your brains would would tell you to start playing with it, um, but like they do reserve the right to make changes as they need to. Um, and Kotlin native itself is still pre 1.0. Um, so you can, you can definitely expect um, some things to be shifting underneath you, um, particularly around the memory model, um, which they're they're still doing some thinking about. Um, and definitely one thing to keep in mind is the IDE support for all of this stuff um, is still a little bit work in progress. Um, so if you're doing multi-platform JVM side stuff, um, it's fairly good if you're using IntelliJ. Um, if you're doing native stuff without multi-platform, um, they're doing some work in C line and in app code um, to, to make that all work. Um, there's not really a good IDE solution at the moment for multi-platform Kotlin native. Um, so what I've mostly been doing is um, using IntelliJ and just building things using the um, command line Gradle tools. Um, the other thing to just keep in mind is this stuff is all new again. Um, there's not a ton of production experience with it yet. Um, I used to say no production experience here, but again, it is being used in the Raycon app, which is pretty cool. Like we're starting to get there. There's not a lot yet, but it's moving. Um, and then probably the biggest thing is there's this theme here where you need to be able to combine the Kotlin knowledge and the iOS knowledge, right? So when you're when you're building the iOS side implementation of a Kotlin module, um, in general, like people in the Android world know Kotlin a lot better than people in the iOS world, right? Um, so there needs we need to kind of start as a community doing more out outreach to our iOS developers, getting them interested in in kind of helping us kind of bind all this stuff together because um, they know these APIs that we need to call, that we need to call into um, and we know the language that we want to write it in. Um, I, I suspect this is going to look a lot like what Kotlin on, on JVM looked like for Android maybe two years ago, two or three years ago, where some people are getting really excited by it, but you had to start getting buy-in um, from the rest of the community. But with that all in mind, um, I highly encourage you to jump into the space and and build your own. Um, so, like, it's still early, um, but it's it's kind of an exciting time to to be part of this community. Um, it's moving quickly. Um, there's lots of people kind of starting to do some interesting things, um, but there's still a lot of low hanging fruit out there. So it's a really neat way if you want to start making an open source contribution. Um, that was kind of what inspired me to jump into it. Is it's this kind of like wide open field where. Uh, you can actually like make a fairly significant mark early on in this ecosystem. So with that, thanks a lot. Um, happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, you can also reach out to me uh, on Twitter. I'm at Russ H. Wolf, um, and there's some links. The uh, I think the top there is my library. Um, in the middle is a uh, write up that JetBrains has uh, on how to do that multi-platform architecture for Android and iOS. And uh, the bottom there is this demo project um, that pretty much any time I've had a question about how to configure something, that's where I've gotten pointed to to get the answer. So thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Sure, yeah, so, so the question is, um, if Kotlin, essentially, if Kotlin is kind of connecting to things at the Objective-C level, and iOS developers are mostly working at the Swift level, um, how do we kind of rectify that bridge? Is that right? Um, so I, th I think, again, you can still kind of leverage the iOS expertise there. Um, so the, uh, essentially what it, what it means is 
like there's there's certain kind of Swiss high constructs that you're not necessarily able to use. Um, but most of the APIs that you want to work with that are kind of like the, the system level iOS stuff, um, those are still written in Objective-C anyway. Um, so what, what you really need from the iOS side is understanding how those APIs work, like understanding what are the things that the platform can do, what are the kind of caveats and gotchas and like things to watch out for when you're using them. Um, I mean, I, I haven't done a ton of kind of super complicated stuff to know all of the like weird little edge cases that you can get into. Um, but I, I, think, I think you can, yeah, like I think what you need is much more what the APIs are and what they can do than worrying about the kind of language specifics. Anything else in the back there? Can you, can you speak up a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, questions around performance. Um, so, I, I I haven't done really any profiling myself, so I I can't really answer that in detail. Um, what what I've kind of heard from the Kotlin team is um, a lot of stuff is not optimized yet, so you can expect it to get better. Um, I'll say I haven't noticed any anything that feels like a problem to me performance wise, um, and I'm not super worried about it because the way things are built. Um, is that each, each platform should be kind of um, interoperating with, with its own native layer in the usual way. Um, so I, I, like, there's some complications there, like the Kotlin native memory model is looking a little different than, than what it would probably look like if you're defining it natively from Swift. But uh, um, like, there, there, there's not like a JNI kind of layer or, or something like that that you're, you're kind of like calling through to access native APIs. Um, you're, you're, Building the whatever the native bytecode is, um, and so it should still look fairly natural to the platform. Anything else in the front there? Um, yes, there. Uh, yeah, I should have put that in this list. Actually, sorry. Um, there is. I, I don't remember the link offhand, but there there is a um, awesome Kotlin native repository that someone put together that has a list of some of them. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I can list a couple off the top of my head. So I mean, obviously, there's this one that I've been talking about. Um, there's a um, SQLite one that TouchLab has been putting together um, called canarch.db. Um, JetBrains has a couple of things. So they're, they have a Kotlin Next serialization library um, that they're um, building native stuff for. Um, they have a HTTP client that they've been building. Um, and uh, KTOR, their like, web framework. Um, is going multi-platform. So there, there's stuff there. There's not a ton yet, um, but you can kind of do some searching and find it. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, so uh, questions around memory management and kind of what you have to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, mem yeah, mem memory management is is a little complicated. Um, I, I, I honestly haven't dug a ton into it myself. Um, mostly what I focused on is kind of wrapping around APIs as simply as possible um, to kind of hopefully kind of leave most of that to the platform itself. Um, so uh, Kotlin Native does give you a bunch of tools around memory management to make sure that, like, you can define things kind of scoped where you want them to be. Um, but that is one area that, that they've talked about um, kind of doing, uh, like, like that, that, that might be changing a little bit as things go. Yeah, so, so Kotlin Native uh, is, is using a reference counter also. Um, but I, I, I'm not super well versed in kind of the details and motivation wise of what that looks like and how that compares to what I was doing natively. Anything else? Cool. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>